Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another special edition of Operation Tango Romeo, the Trauma Recovery Podcast. We have covered psychedelics on this show several times, but I've never had the author of a book related to psychedelics on the show before. So I'm very, very happy to have Dr. Randall Hansen. Randall, thanks for being here. Hey, Mark. Good to see you this morning. I'm happy to be here and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, me too, brother. Me too. So let's start with the difference between healing and coping. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, I know several people who have done multiple, multiple psychedelic journeys with um, like 30 ayahuasca trips and, and and all this. And I'm like, well, if it's so effective, how come Mm -hmm. you got to do it 30 times? What's the dealio exactly? Um, So how would you, from the, the perspective of healing versus coping, how would you describe that to me? I would say a lot of people are coping with trauma, with mental health disorders uh, through the typical mainstream uh, method, which is pharmaceuticals. Uh, Many people are on multiple uh, anti-anxiety, antidepressants. And to me, that's coping where it's not getting at the root cause of the problem. It's just sort of covering the symptoms. And to me, healing is getting at that root cause of the trauma and dealing with it. So talk therapy is, is was often the main way of dealing with that, where you talk it out with a therapist and then you see it in a different perspective and you can now, it doesn't, uh, serve as big a trigger or maybe no trigger at all. The problem with talk therapy is people, A, have to be willing to do it, B, have to be willing to actually share what those deep traumas are. And oftentimes we don't even know what the trauma is. Uh, The best example, since you mentioned a veteran, is this one veteran that went to uh, ayahuasca retreat thinking, you know, to heal the, the military trauma part of it. And his first ayahuasca ceremony was all about an abuse that happened to him that he had shoved so far down, he didn't even remember it. So he had to heal from that first before he moved on to healing from the military trauma. So I think with psychedelics, it varies. In some situations, people are one and done. They've dealt with all that trauma. They've found the tools for how to fix it, and they spend the rest of their life kind of integrating that lesson. For others, it may require multiple times. You know, we're still studying right now things like addiction. And addiction, the most recent studies seem to show that psilocybin worked for many people for maybe a, at least a year with, you know, killing that addiction. But um, after a year, they might need a booster. Now, someone who's done 30 ayahuasca ceremonies, I think that that they're more classified as a psychonaut, someone who's, you know, doing the journeys for the the sake of journeying, not necessarily for the healing part, I think. But, yeah, everyone's different. Well, I've seen both. Uh, I've certainly seen people with the 30 ayahuasca journeys that are still trying to figure it out and still trying to to get the healing, and it's just uh, not sticking. Yeah. So you talk about... The root, cro- the root cause. How do psychedelics get to that root cause? Like, what is it about the experience where they can get um, get there in a day, yeah. where it could take six years of talk therapy? Yeah, I, you know, the first time I heard that that line, you know, six six years or ten years of therapy or whatever, I said, you know, that 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 can't be true. That's just you know a cute saying, but. The, the way that psychedelics uh, disconnect certain things in our brain and reconnect other elements within that uh, break down these, these barriers that we have put up. And so that's the, the one strength of psychedelics is that if we allow it, and that's come to your earlier question, that we have to except at the super, super high doses where the psychedelic will do it for you, you have to do what we call surrender to the medicine. And if you don't surrender, then you're not going to have that healing experience because you're blocking the psychedelics from releasing that into that, into that uh, memory. Uh, but th- for those that do surrender, then it's a, a matter of, it's almost like you're an observer 
to that situation. So you're not that six-year-old child that was abused or, or lost, but you are witnessing it as sort of the older brother or older sister or friend, and you can see what happened and you can see maybe it wasn't as uh, traumatic as you remembered, or you can you get the idea of this is how I can now cope with it with, a, with adult skills rather than child skills. And so it begins a process of then, okay, now I understand what this trauma was and here's how I have to go about healing it. And that's this, the after part. So there, to me, there are three main parts of a psychedelic experience. There's the preparation before, there's the actual psychedelic experience where you have some of these revelations, hope, ideally, hopefully, and then the, the third part is the, the what we call the integration or the work afterwards, where you are now learning, in, implementing the lessons you learned in that psychedelic experience. And you're going to have to start uh, holding that wire away from your shirt. I think it's uh, still still rubbing, rubbing and stuff. Okay. That's all right. Um, one of the key ingredients that that I've got I've got from people just anecdotally is that it suspends ego. And I've certainly seen that uh, in a friend of mine that did a psilocybin <laughs> a journey with a shaman. Uh, where'd your ego go, dude? It was gone for a while. It came back, of course. But yeah. um, but it's it was just gone for a while. So what role does suspending the ego have in in the healing process? It's the ego is sort of our protection. And so the ego is protecting us from these negative experiences that we're having. Of course, ironically, by protecting it, it tends to then cause things like outbursts of anger or feelings of shame or guilt. So uh, what the process does is sort of pushes aside the ego and allows us to, some would say, be our true selves or and some would say be one with everyone um and it allows that uh it, the problem with the the problem with the ego is that it wants to control everything and so it wants to control all these elements in our in our lives and that's fine most of the time but with things like trauma where it's so buried deeply inside us uh, we need to put that ego aside so we can do that do that work um, now for some people after psychedelics the ego actually enhances it's pretty rare but it does happen for some people uh, i met a shaman who or a healer who uh, decided after multiple ayahuasca ceremonies he was god's gift to ayahuasca and, and the greatest healer of all time and uh, definitely not the case definitely not the case but what it does is it wait it, a second it, so you're saying trump is a, is a ayahuasca <laughs> healer <laughs> i'm glad you said that not me uh, but that's, i say but, it with but love that's exa- but yes yeah, but that's exactly what it can happen it can actually make that ego sort of that narcissistic uh, self uh, i have found that it for most people, it just softens that ego and uh, it can do it in all sorts of ways. Uh, I have a friend who can't even write her own bio now because she feels anything she writes is sort of uh, glorifying herself. And that's not what she's about. She's about the greater good. So it, so it just it's just a matter of I guess putting a maybe putting a leash on the ego a little bit is, is the best way to describe it. Different modalities or different plant medicines seem to have a different effect. And from what I've heard also anecdotally is that the iboga um, just destroys the ego unlike any other. Is that uh, what you found as well through your collection of stories? Yes. Uh, those that uh well first of all back just back to your ayahuasca for a second too uh, sure. uh you know people say oh you know the people that are, are have believed the you know the 50 years of of the drug war lies and things like that uh you know that think that psychedelics are 
going to fry our brains or things like that, or that they're addictive. And anyone who's done ayahuasca or anyone who's done ibogaine or a bogo, there is no way they really want, most do not want to go back and do it again, especially ibogaine, because typically in those ceremonies or at least in the more Western versions, there are doctors involved. They have you hooked up to blood pressure and heart monitor because it is a powerful psychedelic and yes it will immediately strip you down to nothing bare bones and then sort of rebuild you as that journey goes along and so typically that's only this that, that psychedelic is typically only used by those who are in the you know in the just toughest situations the deepest depressions the deepest addictions that cannot that haven't been able to been cleared by other more other modalities as you mentioned but uh yeah, I, I began. So, let, let's depth. talk about what uh, getting stripped down yeah. and uh, what it means to have that ego ripped from you and to have it, uh, the truth shoved in your face in a way that you absolutely <laughs> can't resist. There's nothing you can do about it. It's like you're getting beat over the head with a pipe with uh, the truth of yourself. Yeah. Um, how would you describe that? Or did I just <laughs> do it? <laughs> yeah, I think you did it pretty well. Uh, there are good ways and bad ways that you see it, uh, quote unquote, see it. Um, I will say on a extremely uh, high dose uh, psilocybin journey, I opened my eyes to see that I was sort of like this miniature cartoon figure in this gigantic house. Cool. <laughs> and uh, the lesson there was, yeah, you're, 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 you're not uh, very important. Uh, on an ayahuasca ceremony, I walked out of the yurt to the sky that was, ah, oh, wow, uh, so brilliant with, with stars, souls. I, I looked at it as sort of a veil of heaven opening up and just seeing, again, in a more positive way that, I, again, I am just one little speck with billions of these lights above me. So there's different ways that the medicine will show you um, that you're not as important as you think you are, or you're not as big as you think you are. And sometimes if you resist it, it will tend to get a little maybe stronger in those visions to make you realize that, that you just, just to give up the fight. Because the ego, like I said, uh, in so many of these stories, the biggest struggle was surrendering. Now, the higher the dose of the medicine, and certainly some of these medicines like ibogaine and ayahuasca, doesn't matter. It's gonna it's gonna knock that ego down because those medicines are so strong. But in, in lower dose cases, you have to practice surrendering, which is a which is a pretty hard thing to do, actually. I did a solo dose, so without um, a trip sitter, about okay. fifteen grams of golden teachers. <laughs> Whoa. I swung for the fences, baby. And, yeah. uh, uh, and all I could say was I sit on the top of the stairs too much, too much, <laughs> too much. But, um, uh, as I was, uh, I barely had one toe in reality. And, but my wife took a video of me kind of at the, at the later end of it, uh, which I still haven't seen. I, I really should see that. Oh, wow. But she said it was like talking directly to your soul. Oh, wow. That's what she said from her completely oh, sober wow. perspective. It was like talking directly to your soul. Wow. There was no ego, like at all. Um, I, I was like an adult child uh, was, was, was the state that I was in. It was actually funny as hell. It was quite fun. But like in hindsight, although she she didn't think it was too fun because I uh, I wasn't too sure of reality, mm. and so I wasn't sure if I was safe or not. Like I wasn't scared, but I was also not confident in my ability to um, decide if uh, I just OD'd or so or something. I know you can't OD, but when I was yeah, in that state, right. I forgot that knowledge, yeah. and I was like, I think I might have OD'd. <laughs> Cause this is a lot. And, uh, so we went off to the, to the emergency clinic oh, and, no. and it was funny as hell, but, oh. um, uh, like it, but it was funny because I was like a, 
a, a kid just saying what, what was ever in my head and it was pure and sweet yeah. and kind you know there was absolutely no ego and when you strip the ego from you that's what's left pure yeah. sweet kind like yeah. an adult child yeah you know that's who we actually are and the the ego is um the the tragedy of life that's uh come and 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 jaded us that's that's a lot of what the ego is yeah you're right and, and a lot of people talk about that come out of a psychedelic experience with this notion of uh, hey i want to be more childlike i want you know that that you know when we're kids we do all this play and then we become adults and it all becomes work and career and all this stuff and we miss out on that play so there's definitely this element of childlike or child play that comes out of this experience and many people do have that experience of of uh seeing themselves even seeing themselves as a child in their journey um one other thing i'll say about that is yes number one yeah you can't uh overdose on psychedelics or can't i should we should just we should phrase that to say is psychedelics you can't die from an overdose of psychedelics or it's very extreme cases from the drug it from the medicine itself uh unlike many other products but yeah yes uh you know you should definitely know your uh your dosage and what to expect i love that you had a sober friend or partner there your wife so that at least she could help guide you in certain ways that's definitely important uh on one of my highest doses of psilocybin i felt like i had stopped breathing and it was again same thing it wasn't a scary thing to me it was just like wow how am i <laughs> how am i living if i'm not breathing and i had to you know literally then move my hand to my chest and oh yeah no i feel it's you know because again i intellectually i knew of course it was a breathing which is part of the the body's mechanism that was going to happen but I, like you said mentally you're like oh my god i'm stopped breathing and, and this is the end here it comes and uh, in some ways, that's also part of that ego death, because as soon as you say, you know, I surrender to this breathing, uh, it then elevates you to a different place. And then you have a different issue to address or, or concern or vision that you're seeing. It's like uh, on, on the, the super dose that I was talking about, I because it was too much. I'm like, well, how am I going to cope with this? This is a lot. So yeah. I, th I decided to have uh, a shower. And after the shower, as I'm uh, standing there naked in front of the mirror, I was so confused uh -huh. because uh -huh. I was like, that is that me? Wow. You know, like, this is really weird. And what I, uh, I think it is in hindsight was that you are basically a spiritual, like you really do got one foot out of this world and you are experiencing your existence as a spiritual being where your body is almost irrelevant. You realize that you have one, but you also yep. realize that I am not my body. Yeah. My body is just something that I'm hanging out in right now. It's just this meat wagon that I'm, uh, uh trucking around this planet for, 80 years or whatever it's going to be yeah. but uh, that ain't me and looking at myself in the mirror uh was very much that experience like that ain't me that's just this wow. meat bag that i happen to be residing in at the moment at, um, yeah, that's funny yeah I, so many people say don't look in the mirror you know when you're on one of these experience one of these journeys and i think i have because i've walked to the bathroom you know but i, I don't think i've done what I've done what you did, which is, you know, stop and actually look, which would be interesting. I don't think to me, I don't think it'd be scary. It would just be like you did. It'd be kind of a reflection like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm here, but I'm, I'm not here. Or, you know, that, that this realization that you are more of a spiritual being. And that's also a hallmark of psychedelics is most people come away with this greater sense of whether it's God, the universe, the divine angels everyone sees it differently based on their you know their notions but their their faith but it's fascinating so there's some element of that too or just a sense like you did the sense of not immortality but maybe eternity or that life goes beyond goes on because we are spiritual beings beyond the death of this physical body well the, for me the experience was just that i am not my body i am the puppeteer of my body oh very cool and well i had something else in my head oh well let's do something else um, <laughs> so
there's um, among the psychonauts, those that have had trips, there's a debate that I don't even think is an important debate, but it's interesting of is this a hallucination or am I actually jumping between dimensions and experiencing another dimension or another universe? What do you think? What's your opinion? Well, I've been I've been watching uh, this one series on uh, near death experiences, which are very similar to psychedelic experiences because it is again a change of consciousness where they are, you know, going down the tunnel or flying up to meet God or Jesus, and that's almost parallels the the words that people speak from a psychedelic experience, and. Um, and now I just lost where I was going with that. Well, um, so oh, just yeah. I, I, yeah. if you if you think it's a hallucination, yeah. or do you think it's yeah. actually happening, yeah. or a combination, or something else, or is there a third option? Yeah, I, I, that's such a fascinating question because I think in the beginning I was more yeah we're going to different dimensions and we're connecting to different beings and and uh, spreading this global. Uh, celestial maybe consciousness but I don't know, the more and more i listen to the scientists uh rather than the psychonauts uh the more i think it's just uh more connections we're making within our brain that's little fragments of memories and pieces of things because you know you know it, you probably know this with perception you know we are blocking so many stimuli every minute of every day and yet some of it's being stored somewhere in our brain. So I, to me, psychedelics is more finding all these little hidden pockets in our brains that things that we hadn't thought about, maybe didn't even perceive that we saw, and now are making these connections with that neuroplasticity. And that's what's causing some of these uh, hallucinations. Uh, you know, someone, I had a, one of the storytellers talked about waking up in her journey in her mom's womb and actually experiencing her birth in this psychedelic journey and that is so unexplainable and unimaginable to me to be able to witness that and but it's yet, funny you know, it's funny that you say that because uh i've never said this on the show before but i have a very uh, brief memory of being in the womb now, maybe it was just a dream, you know, maybe I dreamt it and it's not right. a memory, but, uh, it's, it feels like a memory, Yep. you know, and, uh, and I know that's unusual, but I, but it's in my head. I remember right. I, it, just a, a couple of clips, just a couple of snippets wow. of being in the womb. Wow. So if I, if I can remember it and I don't think like, I think I know it's rare, but I don't think it's unique. I think there are others that have you know, those faint, faint memories, uh, of just a couple of moments, yeah. uh, of, of long ago. I mean, my, well, my, my wife is mystified by all the, uh, very, very clear memories I have from being one and two years old. I can draw you the floor plan of the house that I lived in, like no problem, wow. you know, at, um, yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, then I would say you do have those, and there's no reason you don't have those memories because, you know, yes, our brains are developing as a newborn, but doesn't mean there's still obviously parts of the brain that are active. Uh, I love that you have that memory. Uh, you know, I was going to mention uh, Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate talks about the story as a mm -hmm. two-year-old where he used snap his mo his mother gave him away to a, a stranger on the street to to save his life, and he didn't remember it as an as an adult but in a psychedelic experience uh with these in, indigenous people in, in canada he had this experience and he had this saw this memory and that helped him deal with that trauma of being you know this he had this you know many years of feeling abandonment and not you know not feeling he's worthy of love and he didn't know where that came from and then wow it came from this when he was two and he was even though he was only a you know I think he was separated from his mother for six weeks or something like that. But even just that, that sense of that two-year-old not understanding why his mother was giving him away caused his lifelong feelings of, of, of uh, abandonment. So yes, these memories are there, but I love that you, that you uh, also had a few brief moments in the womb. 
Gabor Mate is a very interesting dude. I really yeah. enjoyed uh, the wisdom of trauma. He's on the top of my wish list for getting uh, him on, on the show as a guest. But um, it, it's interesting. I agree because it just I just resonate with pretty much everything I've ever heard him say. You know, I I haven't disagreed with with much. Just on how he healing works, what trauma actually is and from the raising of children yeah. and yet it, he is um very much at uh in in contradiction of some of the mainstream folks uh I, I don't know if dr jordan peterson would be considered mainstream but they are at odds about a couple of different philosophies for sure but uh, i'm leaning on the towards the the Gbor mate way of looking at things it just seems right and through the lens of my own personal experience. Oh uh, yeah. I think gabor has got it. Like, yeah. I think, I think he's got it figured out and yet, and he was asked this by uh, Russell brand, like, but mm. how are you not like a hundred percent? Like you, <laughs> you're Gabor Mate with all these experiences and all this knowledge and you heal others. So how come you're not a hundred percent? How come you're still struggling? Like what the heck? And, um, and Gabor dances around that answer. He doesn't answer it, mm. you know, um, uh, he, he just switches the, switches the topic or, which is really interesting. And that's exactly the question I'll ask him if I ever get him on the <laughs> show, but I, I won't, I, I won't let him go. I'll make him answer it, which is probably why he's not on the show. Uh -huh. but, I, I, you know, I, I just want to say, cause I love him. I, I, I also wish I could speak like him because he is just so smooth and deliberate in his talk and it's so beautiful. But you know, I think it might be a case of, of physician not healing thyself because he admits that, you know, he was a workaholic and he was driven to do all these things, and so I think he was just doing no self care. He was just so selflessly helping others that he was ignoring, ironically, writing these books about healing and and not realizing his own need for that. But yeah, uh, uh, my goal is just to go to some conference so I can meet him in person, just shake his hand because I think he's such a beautiful soul. So I hope he gets on your show. I hope that wish list comes true. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed. Maybe he'll yeah. he'll he'll listen to this himself. Yeah. So you're not sure. Um, you, you've switched your mind on whether or not these psychedelic trips are real or whether they're a, a hallucination, and now you're leaning towards. It's, it's all in your head. Is that about yeah, right? I think so. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to describe because, for example, um, when I was at this ayahuasca journey, this uh, other participant after, you know, we were doing an integration circle the next day and he is like, oh my gosh, that journey was so amazing. I had a digital download. I now know how I'm going to develop my product. I have the app in mind. I, the website's been designed for me and all I have to do now is implement it. And I was like, oh, come on, digital download. But I will say that the whole notion of this book came to me on an, an LSD journey. I had no plans to write a book. I wasn't even in my again conscious mind at least i had no plans you know writing books in this day and age is somewhat archaic you know put it on a blog put it on a TikTok, do something differently than, than a book but uh i'm an educator at heart and maybe that's but so anyway so i was on this journey and all of a sudden here was this outline for this book just boom the the, the theme the purpose the the design every element of it and so then the question comes again you know was that a digital download or was it something that was brewing so deeply in my head that i i wasn't aware of it and then it just happened i don't you know i don't know so you know i'm definitely on the fence i i i love the idea that we are connecting to a higher power uh i have an episcopal uh, priest in one of my stories who met with Jesus and in his journey started speaking in tongues. Now, whether that was, again, his brain just switching something and speaking in tongues or whether that was a higher power 
coming through him and speaking in tongues. I, so yeah, I I don't know. I you can't nail me down. I'm I'm just right on that fence, and I, I've seen both sides of it. So it's just hard. To, hard At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. No. It, it doesn't matter if it's all in your head and it doesn't matter if, uh, if it's, you're actually going to other dimensions, it doesn't yeah. matter because does it help? Yeah. That's it. Yep. You know, does it help? Does it work? And that's yeah. all that, that's all that matters. It's the same as, is there life after death? Well, I think so, but if there isn't, I'll never know it. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> right. If it's oblivion, I'll never know it. Right. Um, but in either way, it doesn't matter because it is or it isn't not in control and yeah. whatever. Yeah. But my where I'm at right now with, with the answer to that question is that and it, and it boils, boils down to or harkens back to looking at myself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that the psychedelics help to dissolve the illusion of life. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of scientists saying that we are living in a um holographic universe you know that that everything's an illusion yeah. that our, our that our physical experience is it's all a projection it's a it's a hologram of sorts and i'm considering the possibility that the psychedelic experience dissolves that illusion and shows us for what we actually are and maybe we're all AI, you know, mm -hmm. and this is just, uh, we, we're computer programs, uh, that became conscious and this is just where we are in our evolution. And maybe we get so bored in the, uh, in the metaverse that, uh, we, we decide to, uh, have this VR experience, uh, that we call life who flippin knows, wow. but, um, it seems to me that psychedelics dissolve the illusion of life yeah i i think that's a beautiful way to put that um i i think for many of us we've probably seen the matrix too many times i i know on one of my heavier dosages i was trying to peek out of the corner of my eye to, to pull the matrix you know pull the the this, the screen away to see the reality because I knew I felt like someone was you know like you said that the computers I was plugged into the computer behind me um, and then other times I have had that experience where you know others other scientists talk about how there are multiple dimensions overlapping at the same time so we only see one dimension as we're living now but psychedelics allows us to see other dimensions that even for just a fleeting second that are out there i don't know if that element is true or your theory is true i do love the idea of that disillusion of our understanding of the body and and i don't know it's, that's a beautiful theory i was looking at some ai art recently it's uh people are finding this app and they're going hey here's ai versions of art this is what i look like with ai art uh, yeah i've seen that and so much of it is like a psychedelic experience and it kind of lends to maybe we are AI. Maybe it's already, the singularity has already happened and, and that's what we all are. And uh, maybe we're re-experiencing some ancient history when biological life was a thing, or maybe we were just imagining, um, the idea of biological life. So we created this, uh, this, this matrix to go, Hey, what would that look like? Right. I mean, who knows? But I do know that with the psilocybin experience, the patterns, the the complexity, the depth of of what I have seen, it, it, it my brain does the same thing every time. I was like, how? I don't think I'm smart enough to see this. <laughs> I don't think my brain is smart enough to see this. You know, to to conjure this up, mm. the, the the intricacy of of the lace and and the patterns and the geo and the geometry. And, and having it like deep, you know, it's, it's like a hundred layers deep of wow. geometric, uh, uh, patterns and the colors. And I don't think my brain's smart enough, you know, like if I could, if I can do this in, in an experience, how come I, I can't just whiz through quantum physics. Right. Right. You know, so my 
perception is that I'm not smart enough to see that, you know, I'm to conjure that up out of the ethers. Yeah. I think I'm experiencing this. I think I am simply becoming more aware of what is. And that's where I, I come to the idea of it's just reality dissolving into what our actual reality, our actual state of being is. And, um, which would be pretty weird because if, uh, after my final breath, I end up in mushroom land for, for an attorney, I'm like, okay, this is going to take some getting used to. I, I could see why I want to escape and come to a much, um, uh, more restricted perception of mm -hmm. this life. Yeah. It would make yeah, sense. I, it does make sense. I, and the one thing I, I, I haven't looked this statistic up, but I remember hearing it as a kid. And so it's probably been disproved many times over now, but it seems like growing up, they used to say, you know, we only use what 10% of our brain. I don't know if, if scientists have changed that theory since then, yeah, but it's if probably a lot case, less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if that's the case, maybe the psychedelics do. Yes. You know, so again, to go opposite your theory, maybe psychedelics just turn a switch and say, well, instead of 10%, now you have 40% of your brain going and you're like, whoa, maybe. overload. I don't know. Maybe. Well, let's talk about the, uh, the neurology of psychedelics. So the claims are from, from the psychonauts, and I believe it's probably true, is that it creates a psychedelic experience in particular with psilocybin creates and rebuilds neural pathways. Yep. Now that's a physiological claim. Uh, are you aware of any science that backs that up? I know they are doing all these imaging studies that have shown uh, that are showing these these new connections. So I think the science is just getting to where that where these claims have, have been anecdotally been making for for some years now. But I think we're seeing that neuroplasticity, and I think they're even testing a non psychedelic version of psilocybin that will also have that same neuroplasticity benefits but without the the hallucination part so if people don't want that the crazy experience of you know uh the walls bouncing or or yeah the crazy geometric patterns or uh trees waving at you or whatever crazy things people see then they can that's the, i think that's one of the future interesting pathways this non-hallucinogenic uh, uh tool because i think i think the science will show that that these psychedelics are very positive for brain health and and brain uh, growth even where is the science right now as it relates to depression and anxiety, I know for a fact for a guy that's been uh, trying to recover from PTSD since 2017, that, wow, what a help when it comes to depression and anxiety and su suicidal ideations. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the experience that a lot of people have, which is it sticks for like a year or some, in some cases permanently. Right. Um, but man, it takes the foot off the gas for a month or two and that's pretty damn good. So where, yeah. where, where, where are we, uh, with the science on, on, on the efficacy? Well, I know I'm trying to remember which trials, uh, you know, we have the MDMA is working on PTS and then the uh, psilocybin is doing depression. And all those trials are going forward with uh, results of the psychedelics versus placebo uh, greatly enhanced. I, I can't remember the exact percentages. I don't have the studies in front of me, but it's something like uh, placebo slash the typical SSRI uh, antidepressant versus the psychedelic, the, the Placebo might be 20% and the psychedelic is something like 60%. So again, it's, yeah, it's not perfect. It's not 100%. Um, it's not a magic pill. Although in some cases, like addiction, we've had people that have even done something like ketamine and next day they, and they've been a, like a pack a day cigarette smoker. They do a ketamine treatment and the next day they have no interest in smoking and they never smoke again. 
I think that's pretty rare. It's more likely that it takes multiple experiences. And like I said, it takes this integration of the experience to really make these changes. The point of therapy, more than just processing trauma, is to reframe. Yeah. It, it's reframing traumas and ideas. And it's also to have those aha moments and those aha insights. And that's where psychedelics uh, outperform talk therapy, uh, and especially if it's guided psychedelics, with uh, which I've never done, which I'd love to have a guide. Um, yeah. I would love to do that. I just have not had the opportunity yet. I would take it in a heartbeat mm -hmm. if anybody's offering. Yeah. Um, would love to have a shaman or some sort of guide. Yeah. But yeah. these insights, um, it, the psychedelics help you be super duper introspective yeah so they, they, they help you. Psilocybin, especially yeah. Psilocybin. yeah um well i like the golden teachers with psilocybin mm -hmm. and you know that really helps with the introspective part yeah. and it also it's almost like it plugs you into global consciousness and helps you see the big picture of things and the effects so what it did for me um on uh, on microdose actually i was taking some really light doses and what it showed me was the effect of alcohol and the truth of alcohol. And I'm not an evangelist. Like uh, mm -hmm. I tell my, my boys who are 16 and 14 now, it's like, if you want to have a drink, have a drink. And just here's the pros and cons, mm -hmm. you know, here's, here's what it did to my life. And uh, I was never a raging alcoholic, but, uh, it, but it was a, I was a problem drinker, I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I haven't had a drop in two years, seven months and change. And it's because of the microdosing. Because what wow. they showed what they showed me was a, a few things. They showed me connections. And it seems like psilocybin is all about connections and, and actual neurological connections in your brain and, yeah. and taking the unhealthy ones and giving you better ones and um, different insights. But the connections that it showed me when it comes to alcohol is, one, every thing that makes me cringe at night while I'm trying to get to sleep when I go, Oh God, why did I say that? Mm -hmm. Alcohol was involved mm -hmm. just about every time, you know? And so it showed me that and it showed me on a global level how it's a great big trick. It's almost like, um, uh, the, the Bible's right. And the devil does run the world. And one of the lubricants that he uses to, to, to get people to, to do his bidding is alcohol. Yeah. Um, but then I saw it from a frequency perspective, perspective, like as love, if we'll agree is a, is a high frequency, you know, uh, perhaps the highest, I don't know, but, um, that's the, the bright white light, yeah. you know, high frequency. And disdain or indifference is way at the bottom. That's very, very low frequency. Yep. And alcohol lowers your frequency. So it dims your light. It dims your light. It lowers your frequency. And yeah, it's, it's fun when you take it because the low frequency things are fun. Mm. The carnal things are fun. You know, if you just give in to hedonism yep. and uh, have the one night stands and, and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Mm -hmm. And it's destructive to your life. Yep. So the, all these fun things that are also destructive, um, alcohol is the gasoline to, to that fire. Yeah. Uh, and that's where it's a trick. Because yep. it's fun in the short term, suffering in the long term. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why it's a trick. So psilocybin showed me this one night on microdose. Like I wasn't, ha I wasn't tripping. I wasn't uh, have, having the experience, but it just all just, it's like the fog cleared. Yep. The noise stopped and I just saw it. Love it. Love. And I haven't had a drink since that night. Wow. wow. You know, I, I, you know, micro, I'm glad you brought it up for multiple reasons. One, I love the story. Congratulations. Um, I've heard other addicts, or you weren't an addict, but other people that had problems with either drugs or alcohol to either high degrees of addiction or just problems. That's maybe you were experienced, you weren't addicted, but you had issues. The psychedelics definitely seem to, I, and that I definitely don't understand how that works, but it seems to get right to the root of it and, and show you that, yeah, that's just not needed in your life anymore. And 
crazy of me to think that. But microdosing, I when this when this digital download that I talked about came to me, I didn't have microdose. Microdosing wasn't part of that outline originally. And uh, then the more I started talking to people, the more these stories like yours came up where from microdosing, which yeah, has no hallucinogenic factors. In fact, most of the time, a lot of people don't even feel anything from taking the microdose. Um, it's just something that happened, but things happen as you've explained. I've had people that- But I always feel a mood lift with a microdose. Yeah, there is a, there's a mood lift or clarity that sometimes happens. Uh, and uh, the problem is most of the research until recently has been pretty bad with microdosing. So the early research shows really probably well, the, 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 there, there is some, uh, actually the, the most recent stuff from about three yeah. months ago That's what is, I'm looking, saying, the is looking really good about microdosing. Yeah. Yes. The more recent research now is finally doing the same better protocols that the macrodosing research has been doing. So now we're seeing, uh, research we can hang our hat on before we could still talk about it and certainly talk about all these anecdotal cases, but now we're actually seeing research that shows that microdosing can have all these multiple benefits and, and also help with neuroplasticity growth uh, just as, as much as a macrodose can. So let's talk about some of the uh, naysayers and, and some of the concerns people have. Yeah. Um, let's start with uh, people that work up north and they have to pass a P test. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, does any of this stuff uh, show up in a, in a urine test for, for drug screening? From my understanding, and again, I'm not an expert in these tests, but that I just had, was on a call yesterday where they were talking about this and that most drug tests do not measure or look for psychedelics so that that would not be part of it. Obviously, cannabis and uh, the, the real drugs, heroin, coke, and, and those would be, but... Um, psychedelics are rarely included in those tests. And let's talk about the, the terminology. So people will say, oh, that's drug use when they're talking about psychedelics and yeah. as opposed to that's, that's medicine. And yeah. yet they'll, they'll say opiates are medicine. They're not drugs. It's, um, it, it's interesting. So where's yeah. the line between drugs and medicine? Oh, that's, that's the question of the day. Uh, we see that all the time. Someone who says, well, I would never take a drug and then they're on five prescriptions. It's like, <laughs> uh, wait a second, there's something strange here. I think the biggest battle we face with, in psychedelics is that we have these past 50 years of the drug war and don't just say no and dare and all these programs to discredit psychedelics. And it, it still blows my mind just how political these decisions were made in the, in the 60s and early 70s because we have all this research from the 50s and 60s that proved that psychedelics have amazing benefits. They were looking at uh, LSD for, for reducing alcoholism back then. Well, I think and, that's exactly why uh, well, uh, yeah. they, 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 they fell out of favor because they work. Right. And, and, and the irony for them to be put on a substance schedule one, which says they have no medicinal value, along with the likes of heroin. And, and, and you know, it just blows my mind because these definitely have medicinal value. But well, uh, I mean, replace the word heroin with just opiate, or opiate uh, right now. you know, <laughs> they're prescribed all the damn time and yeah. barbiturates, which are yeah. even worse. You know, uh, yeah. it can kill you to try to get off them. And but they're prescribed by doctors. And addictive as hell, insanely dangerous barbiturates are insanely different. Yeah. Um, damn near killed uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson because he was prescribed barbiturates because he's a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. Right. So a psychiatrist said, "Hey, here's some uh, barbiturates without informed consent." Didn't tell him wow. of the potential dangers, and only because of his extensive resources, because the dude's got some bank. Uh, only because of that, he was able to find help in Serbia or something, wow. uh, wh where 
they were able to do a protocol to to get him off the the addiction. Methadone was not doing it. And it was absolute torture for more than a year. I think it might have been even two years of unimaginable torture to get off these barbiturates that he took prescribed from a doctor and took them as prescribed, did not abuse them, wasn't treating them like street drugs, took the prescription as prescribed and and he survived. But if it was me or you or anybody with a normal amount of resources, I'm just assuming you don't make $2 million a month. Mm-hmm. Um that we'd be dead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say the two great documentaries related to that would be Dope Sick. And I just watched Xanax, or I, Xanax was in the title. I can't remember the whole name of the title the other night. And I knew Xanax will, and, and uh, Benzos were also bad, but I didn't realize just how horrible they were. Also, they are also to get off of once you're on it. I mean, it is a process that is ridiculous. And yet, yeah, and so we have all these prescriptions out there. Uh, I think this, the statistics are something like one in three of us have at least one prescription and some ridiculous amount, two thirds have, have multiple prescriptions uh, and more people die from prescription deaths, from alcohol. It's in the top five. Everything more than it, psychedelics. psychedelics you know, it's in it's in the top five, Randall. I mean, yeah. um, I, I think it's number four or five for leading causes of death is taking yep. prescription medication yes. as prescribed. Yes. Yep. Like taking it properly. Yes. Taking prescription medication as prescribed is in the top five. Yes. Taking it improperly, which is really easy to do, is, is even more dangerous. Yep. I've as seen the it. I've seen ambulances come to my parents' house uh, probably on four different occasions because of four different drugs between the two of them <sighs> where they, where they would have um, uh, either pass out or uh, heart would start beating out of their chest and they think they're dying. Either way, ambulances come to the house four different times because of taking prescription medication uh-huh. as prescribed. The fact that they're still kicking is unbelievable. You know, they're just tough old boots. They are. Yeah. I have, I have one woman uh, in my story who uh, was, at the end of her rope and was already on uh, antidepressants and on uh, Benza, I can't remember which one, I think it was Xanax. And she went to her doctor and said, I- I'm at the end of my rope. And his solution was just to upper dosages in both medications. And <laughs> uh, so it's, it's frustrating. We, you know, we, yes, some of these medications do wonderful things, certainly things like blood pressure medication and insulin and things like that but these these antidepressants these uh, these uh, anti-anxiety meds are just so dangerous for us and they were never meant to be long your microphone your, your microphone's rubbing again oh sorry you just got to hold it away yeah um, but i'll i'll give you a a, an ex- a very recent example um now this hasn't doesn't have to do with mental health or psychedelics but it does have to do with um conventional thinking with with drugs so uh, a friend of mine uh, passed away recently uh, at the age of 57 and uh, he was a first nations fella and i went to his hereditary reservation as um, i was accepted as a member of the family and i uh, partook in the two days of ceremony to to lay him to rest and one of the, his sister walked in, Mary, who I'm going to have on the show. She's a lovely lady. Oh. Uh, but Mary uh, uh, comes in with her walker, all hunched over and messed up. Uh, and uh, I said, oh, what happened to you? And she goes, it's my sciatic nerve. Oh. That's I said, Well, how long has this been going on? Two years. You've been using a walker for two years because of sciatic pain? Wow. Yeah. It's like, well, I got some good news and bad news for you. The bad news is there was no reason for you to suffer like this. The good news is I can fix you. I'm not a doctor or a chiropractor and I can fix you right now. How do I know? Because I suffer from sciatic pain and, uh, and I know how to fix it when it flares up, uh, in myself or others. And, and, uh, her and her husband look at me like I had three heads, but they're like, uh, we'll try it. She's in a walker, a walker hunched over like an old granny, right? So uh, I, I took her, laid her down on the blanket on the ground, 
We did a very, very simple stretch. The chiropractors call it the million dollar roll. I did it without cracking anything though. I just did it as a stretch hmm. and, uh, on one side. And then you know, we all heard the pop and it just kind of reacts. And then I did the other side and then she stood up without any assistance mm -hmm. and walked out of the room without her walker. Wow. So here's little old me, not a doctor, not a healthcare provider. So when they walked into their doctor's office without the walker, the doctor who'd been prescribing her pills for the last two years and just up the dose, up the dose, painkiller, painkiller, muscle relaxant, painkiller. He's like, what the hell is this? Well, our, our, our friend Mark did it uh, from what he learned from chiropractors and YouTube videos in like in less than under a minute after two years of suffering. Yeah. Now, I'm no genius. I just know one stretch. Now, here's somebody who's a medical doctor, however many years of school, and just kept giving pills. Yeah. Why didn't he take the time to look to, I wonder how else this could, might be able to be treated. I wonder what else is available out there. Had he spent 10 seconds asking himself that question, could have cracked open a YouTube video. How about stretches for sciatic uh, impingements? Yeah. And then he would have been able to do it. Or maybe yeah. how about this? How about talk to a chiropractor and say, hey, I'd like to learn your perspective on this. Because I haven't been able to, to do anything but give pills. But they don't give a shit. No, I'm going to say that. I would never hear a regular doctor mention chiropractor. <laughs> no. You know, it's a shame. It's a horrible shame. You know, yeah. um, conventional medical doctors are fantastic at emergency wet yep. medicine. Yep. You, you yep. got a broken arm yep. or uh, so, something is super life-threatening and, and really scary. Uh, they're awesome at that. Trauma yep. surgery. Like yep. if I was a doctor, I'd want to be a trauma surgeon. I wouldn't yep. want to do anything else because it's pure, yep. right? But um, that that's all they're good at. Yeah. Everything yep. else, they're really good at keeping you sick. Yeah, I knew the world had changed about 15 years ago when I went in for my annual wellness check. And my doctor, the first thing he said to me was not, how are you or how are you doing? How are you feeling? He was, what prescriptions do you need? And I was like, whoa, we are in a different world now. If he's asking me what prescriptions I need rather than the doctor telling me. And so I, yeah, I think we're in a world where the pharmaceutical industry has way too much power and uh, influence, both in terms of marketing these prescriptions right to consumers, but also in the doctors. And the doctors, as you mentioned, you know, they have under more pressure, spend less time with patients, have more patients per day, can make more money, insurance, things like that. And so we have this almost pill mill, not quite. I don't want to be that that dramatic. Well, but. I don't know if it's the true in Canada, but in the States, doctors very openly and legally get kickbacks for prescriptions. So yeah. the pharma rep uh, uh, shows up and says, hey, this is the drug of the day. We'd yep. really like it because this has a much, much bigger profit margin. So yep. if you could just prescribe the hell out of this uh, new bit of snake oil, um, we really appreciate it. And by the way, um, here's a new Mercedes. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, and the kickbacks are significant. I think uh, the, these doctors get uh, as much income in kickbacks in some cases as they do from just running their practice. Like it's over the top. Yeah. And it's just like there's a pill for everything and for everything there's a pill. Yep. And, uh, and that's just not how health works. It's just not yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, totally agree. You know, back in the day where they were writing prescriptions for go take a walk in the park or go a walk in nature. And, and, you know, we've lost that because so many of these things can be changed by just make a change in our habits. You know, walking every day will take a couple of pounds off and help the blood flow better. But we don't, you know, doctors don't ask that. Don't ask, well, are you exercising at all? Are you, you know, what's like you said, there's no questions. It's like, oh, back pain. Okay, here's a pill. See you next month or next six months or whatever. Yeah, that's it. Let's switch gears to your book. Yeah. So, um, at what point did you go, Hey, I'm going to put this book together? Yeah, it was, uh, I think late summer. And, 
as I mentioned, I the one thing I had been ruminating, it wasn't a book, but I in in the last couple of years, you know, I've been really hunting down stories because I I I love hearing these stories of transformation. I mean, there are absolutely stunning stories of, you know, people, especially the veterans, because the veterans are so heartbreaking to me, you know, the night before they did psychedelics, you know, or a couple of days before they did psychedelics, you know, they had a gun to their head. And then after psychedelics, they are so far away from that person they were then it uh, blows my mind. But the thing I noticed in all these stories is that there, what, there were, and that's part of the problem with the psychedelics too. It's this thing we call you know, ineffable. We can't really describe it well. You know, we talk about seeing Jesus or hearing God speak to us, but then we think about it like, well, I didn't really hear God's voice, but it was like, I, I heard it through telepathy or something. It's just, so it's, it's crazy to, to hear these things, but I didn't, I never heard the details like, oh, well, you better be ready to have a, to purge and, and vomit, or you better be ready to have a bad headache or things like that. So one of the things I thought was missing in all, in these stories that I was reading or seeing on videos was I didn't, I want to know the nitty gritty, like what was the experience? And so in this, uh, LSD journey where I had this download, the, the, the book idea was, well, let's get, get stories, but collect them in such a way that you'll get the details, you know, how many, what dose of the medicine do they take? What was the medicine? What was their set and setting? What was the experience? What did it feel like as much as they can remember? Uh, what happened during the experience. So it's not just all the wonderful, oh my gosh, I saw God and, and um, now I realize I'm God's child. But, oh, well, before I got to that point, I was vomiting 10 times, you know, purging as they talk about with ayahuasca, especially. Um, so the idea was not a book that's all about the science. Uh, there is science in there, but there are already books out there about the detailed science of almost all these, the major psychedelics. And it wasn't a book that was going to be written by me as much. It was going to be written by the people telling their stories. Yeah. So it's, it's a compend a compendium. It's a collection yes. of uh, other people telling their stories and uh, then you doing the editing and putting it all together. Yes. Yeah, so we have a couple of intro chapters just about the history and, and the psychedelics, but then the bulk of it is, yeah, these stories of, uh, and again, all walks of life. Um, I did, tr the one goal I had was to try to get more women and people of BIPOC in the book because it's, they're very underrepresented in psychedelics. Uh, and of course, it's, I see the irony of as, as an older white guy doing this, but that was sort of, the, again, this mission that came to me in this during this journey that we had to give voice to the underrepresented. Um, and then the other thing that came during this journey was that all the proceeds from this uh, book are going to a couple nonprofits in the space, Heroic Hearts Project, which is this amazing nonprofit that's helping veterans, uh, mostly with ayahuasca, but with also other plant medicines. And then uh, Tracuna, which helps with the indigenous uh, peoples and in, in protecting their uh, rights to their medicine that have had for centuries. And with these stories, are they also including the healing journey or the healing benefits? Like this is who I was before. This yeah. is who I am after. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, so, you know, every journey is different. Some are a little more subtle than others. Some are, wow, this person was in, you know, in the dark, 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 and now they're in the light. And, and, and of course those are, are the stories we, we all love to resonate with, but yeah, they're, so they're all, uh, they talk about every aspect of it. If they've done other psychedelics or other modalities of healing, they talk about that as well. Uh, a lot have done talk therapy, a lot have done yoga, meditation, breath work, uh, 
probably about a quarter were on some type of prescription drugs that they had to taper off before their psychedelic experience. And all of them are no longer on those, uh, those prescription drugs anymore. So who are you before psychedelics and who are you now? Uh, before psychedelics on my LinkedIn profile, I called myself a polymath, uh, which now just sounds kind of silly and a uh, stretch of the imagination. But uh, because I had my hand in five or six different things and, and I have this PhD and, uh, and after psychedelics, I just saw that like even even taking a selfie now just for family is hard for me to do. Uh, even now looking at the screen, I can't look at myself as I'm talking to you. I'm <laughs> trying to look just at the camera or you because it's hard seeing myself because and even talking about this is my book because it's I, I more time refer to it as the book. But then people are saying, wait, which book are you talking about? Your book or some other book? I'm like, OK, my book. But. Uh, so that's kind of the process that happens. Where so if I could attempt to translate and you tell yeah. me if this resonates. Yeah. So the person before and the person after the person before embraced your ego and the person after is actually repulsed by your ego. Kind of. Yeah. I, I, repulsed or certainly like stay in the corner, you know, uh, you know, once that ego from psychedelics has sort of been put in a cage, you kind of like that feeling a little bit. I mean, like you said, you need the ego to survive. You need to have that central control for sure, but it doesn't need to be out of control. It doesn't need to be this grandiose feeling. And so, yeah, it, it just also opens up a path for more, for more empathy and more compassion for people that may be in your ego and your, and again, it's not that the ego is so bad, but sometimes the ego is so focused that it's not seeing the other people that you're mowing down in your process to get ahead or whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Well, that, that uh, is an interesting explanation of the lack of empathy of narcissists and, mm. uh, and, and even to a higher degree sociopaths where all they can see is what's in it for them and because they're engulfed in ego perhaps yep. narcissism and socio sociopathy is nothing more than being ruled completely by ego or dominantly by yep. ego so these are just levels of ego dominance over a person's life yeah i think that's a very good insight yeah well sir um i appreciate you being on today that yeah. was a very that was a very quick hour and seven minutes Wow. Yeah, that is fast. I don't really I put a time, a time limit on it, but I think we're, we're about there. How do people find your book? They can, uh, we have a website, uh, trauma, uh, triumph over trauma book.com. They can also go to Amazon where it's the eBooks for, uh, on presale, uh, and the paperback and ebook will be available in early 2023. Triumph over trauma, everything that you okay. want to know about uh, the anecdotal experiences, plus a little extra. Oh, there That's you go. Good. There's your byline. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, thanks, Our, Mark. I really appreciate your time. Randall, uh, stay on the line. There's an outro once I click this. It, it says, uh, thanks for tuning in. Just stick around till after that. Okay. And everybody else, thank you for your kindness, your support. Thank you for liking and sharing and subscribing. And thank you for all the notes that I get all the time about the value that you've seen in this show. Thank you so much. Please share that value. If you've seen uh, value, if you've heard value, if you've heard healing and you think it's a good thing, please share it. Share, share like the sugar bear because mm -hmm. sharing is caring. You're listening to Operation Tango Romeo, the Trauma Recovery Podcast.